at their own 45, but they are 25 yards away from a first down. Back to throw is Mike Pagel. Rolls away from the pressure. He comes back right. Looks down the field. He's looking for some help. Throws it over the middle. And he's caught. He's a net. Oh. From Baltimore to Indianapolis, fantastic finishes have been a part of the Colts' legacy. Miracle maker Joe Washington once finished off a dramatic comeback when he threw for a touchdown, caught one, and ran one back as the Colts scored 27 fourth-quarter points to win. And my Joe Washington returned 91 yards. Oh, my, go to war, Miss Agnes. If we find a guy, would we got this guy? And did the Raiders ever find a guy when they got George Blanda? In 1970, at the age of 43, Blanda came off the bench to captivate the country with enough miracle finishes to be named Player of the Year. Goal from 53 on. The odds against this must be about 76 million to a half. It's 2020. Seven seconds to go. And here's your ball game. Here it is. Snap. Spot it. It's kicked. That's got a chance. That is good. It's good. The state of Texas has a history of duels to the death. Some have even occurred on the football field. Once when Bum Phillips' Oilers faced high noon in the game's final moment, only a touchdown would win. Ronnie Coleman then earned his place in Texas history when he shot down seven would-be tacklers on his way to the winning score. But the Oilers have never given the kiss of death as often as their neighbors, the Dallas Cowboys. When they sacked the Saints' Ken Stabler with under two minutes to play, it became the only time in NFL history that a team losing by a point won by a point on a safety. It was one of many happy endings at Texas Stadium, but some nine years earlier, an obscure rookie quarterback witnessed what appeared to be a horrid chapter in the Cowboys-Redskins rivalry. When the Redskins knocked Captain Comeback Roger Staubach unconscious in the third quarter, the Cowboys' only hope for victory fell in the lap of that baby-faced rookie quarterback. There'd been a lot of talk in that particular game. Darren Talbert actually came out and said they were going to knock Roger out. When the talk starts, Landry came out and said, well, they're talking. said, so they're going to knock Roger out, and all we've got left is that, is that rookie, you know, nameless rookie. And, he, and then he just kind of would turn his head and look at me like this, you know, like, well, because one of the biggest nightmares of head coach in the NFL is to send in the rookie. Clint Longley is the hope of all obscure players. <laughs> you know, they come off of the bench in a tight situation and go to and have a, a great glory have that after. That was a tremendous performance. You just couldn't believe it. I was afraid they weren't going to sit me in. You know, I was all they had left, but I was confident. You know, I felt like at the time I was a gunfighter with a football. You know, I, uh, if, if there was somebody open, I could hit them. This gunslinger from Abilene demonstrated a hair trigger release when he sighted in on Billy Joe Dupree for his first touchdown. Blaine and I made the comment is that when Longley got in there, he just looked back and he just looked, well, is anybody open? And he just, you know, threw it. And that was the statement, the triumph of the uncluttered mind. 28 seconds remained, and the fate of the Cowboys rested in the hands of a crazy rookie who hunted rattlesnakes for fun. Longley answered his call to glory with the winning touchdown pass that climaxed one of the most unique comebacks in Cowboy folklore. Longley's once-in-a-lifetime performance marked both the sunrise and sunset of his career. But he did leave behind one exquisite moment, much like Tom Dempsey, who for one glorious moment in 1970 was the greatest kicker who ever lived. Born with a deformed right hand and foot, as well as a burning desire to succeed, Dempsey was called upon to do something beyond his capabilities. And he did it. Tom Dempsey will try to kick the longest field goal in National League history. They're sending him on with two seconds left. Here's a snap. The ball is down. Dempsey kicks. It's on the way.
of times in my life now when my day doesn't go well. When you're in the real world, which I am now, and I have to sell every day, it's not just producing on Sundays, it's producing every day now to keep your job. And I haven't had a good day. Uh, I walk in the house, and as I look up there, I've still got the football. And I can sit down, and I can say, well, one day I wasn't too bad. Dinner with John Madden in the city bank. many things. The Hail Mary is one of them. A prayer of a pass. But is it simply an act of desperation dependent on a miracle? Or is it planned? A miracle by design? Most likely, it's a little bit of both. Its point of origin can be traced. The wing in a prayer concept was conceived somewhat by accident in San Francisco's Kizar Stadium in the 1950s when 49ers quarterback Y.A. Tittle would heave up a last-second pass. Tittle said, that's a real alley-oop. Now, why he said that, I'll never know, you know, but he said it, and from then on, that was our alley-oop play. We'd come in the huddle, we'd just call the pass blocking and say, oop. Named after a vaudeville routine, the alley-oop catch became the specialty of a receiver named R.C. Owens. In San Francisco, they, they talk about the fans standing um, twice during a ball game. They stood for the national anthem, and they always stood for the alley-oop pass. Ten seconds left. The Lions lead it, 31-28. Again, Owens flanked to the right. This has got to be the alley-oop. There is no time for anything else. Tittle throws. Owens is double-teamed. He's going downfield near the goal line. He goes up. He's got it. The Atlanta Falcons call it the Big Ben, the pass that beats the clock. The Falcons will have to go 57 yards for a score here, and they need a touchdown, not a field goal. Three wide receivers are all on the right. Markowski with a snap, drops the throw. Clock is running now, down to 17, throws long. Everybody's down there. The Saints look like they're there. There's a ball in the air. Jackson catches it. Touchdown, Atlanta. It's a design play, but it also has to be a lucky play for you to catch it. I mean, it might happen one out of 25 times. We probably have had as many successful Hail Mary plays as any of the team in the National Football League, and, and uh, we do practice it. But I've got to say that there's more fortune involved than skill, although skill does come into play. You have to have good athletes that can recognize where that ball is going to be and take advantage of it. A Hail Mary pass dug the Vikings out of a hole and put them in the playoffs in a late season game against the Browns. They trimmed the lead from 14 points to one with one play left. Oh my goodness, two missed field goals and two extra points. And the Vikings trail by one, but the crowd has not given up yet. 23 to 22 in favor of Cleveland. Five seconds left, first down, Cleveland 46. He's going deep, down the right side, and it is fought for, and it's touchdown! 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 I don't believe it! Touchdown, Cleveland! 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 Touchdown, Cleve
the only way they could do it was with a miracle. I hate to admit it, but uh, I, had, I didn't think we had any chance to win the Minnesota game. We came back and I said, Drew, can you run an in route and then break it deep? Then I'll pump, uh, get Krause. I'll keep Krause away from them from getting over to you. And Staubach came back uh, and gave us a pump fake to my right side as I looked at Staubach. And that one split second just turns you. And he threw the ball way left into the deep corner. I saw him throw the pass, and it was a very lofty pass. You can tell by the flight of the ball, it just went up. I relaxed when he released the ball because uh, I just thought there was no way that uh, there would be anyone there to receive it. The blessing to the whole play was that Starbuck underthrew uh, me on the play, and I was able to put on the brakes and come back. Nate fell down. And I couldn't believe when I had the ball, and the fans in Minnesota, of course, couldn't believe it either. The stadium was done. I mean, I've never been in a stadium that was so quiet. And I think that particular play was, was the biggest single play that I've ever been a part of. Well, the Cowboys need a miracle. Second and ten. Cowboys from the 50. Again, Staubach has him in the shotgun formation. Roger takes the snap. Pumps it once. Last gas for the Cowboys. He's going long. Down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. With Roger Staubach's Hail Mary pass, football gained a marriage of man and moment, of fantasy and destiny, worthy of legend. This hammer is twice as... He made a final play in the game. He's in the mind. He scores! And we've got overtime in Detroit! 34-34 tie. We're in sudden death overtime. Long count. Oh! It's over Erksleben's head. Possible field position. Jaworski, Rick Trace, he's looking. He fires the football. Complete the quick. He's going to go. 25-40. Over time, when the extraordinary and the unusual take center stage, there's the excitement of the quick strike, the disbelief at the unexpected. When each play could be the last, the intensity reaches white hot levels. Overtime was first played in the National Football League in 1958, when the nationally televised championship mesmerized millions. It placed added pressure on its participants. In the locker room, everybody's nervous for the first time we've ever played in the championship game, and uh, Weeb's going down. Each guy, he brought each guy in. He drafted, he knew us, and he's going down, saying where we came from. He picked us up off the sand lots. He had a great speech. But about five or six of us never heard it because we were in the, in the head throwing up. We were, you know, we were nervous. Pressure never seemed to affect John Unitas. But his high top shoes and remarkable resolve were not yet commonplace in 1958. Only his third year in the league. Desperate times can produce heroic performances. And with time running out, Unitas passed the Colts into possession for the field goal that left the game tied, and the clock at zero. It was, it was very strange. You know, we were all asking each other what happens next, or, you know, the rules weren't too clear on that. On that. So, uh, but that's, again, where, where a guy like Unitas always stepped in there. He was, he was the brains of the option, no question about it. The result was the NFL's first venture into sudden death overtime. And the bold Unitas elevated this championship to legendary proportions. An image of victory was sketched to be forever frozen in time. Well, I was just thinking about a score. A field goal really never entered my mind. I I've, I've never have uh, put too much strength on field goals myself. I'd ra ra rather go for a touchdown. I knew right then and there that uh, we had the ball game won. John was somewhat criticized for not uh, calling a timeout there and going for the field goal. I think a lot of people have forgotten that it was uh, it was third down. They thought we were going for, for it on fourth. But 
uh, in the event that we missed it, we still had, you know, time for the field goal. But an interesting thing uh, on that play, which was the genius of a Unitas, and a lot of people missed this, we were on the right hash mark, and everybody in the world, including the Giants, thought we were going to go for an off tackle to the left, and if we missed, we'd be right smack in front of the goal post. And John just took that little bit of a gamble and ran to the right, and everybody was stacked to the left, and he had Lenny Moore there, who was not known as a great blocker, and he threw a key block, and it was wide open. I mean, there wasn't anything to the play. The coach at the line of scrimmage. United takes. He gives to Amici, and the ball game is over. Alan Amici has scored the touchdown, and the Baltimore Colts are the professional football champions of the world. Baltimore 23, the New York Giants 17. You know, it wasn't a, a picture-perfect type game. It, I think it was just a dramatic ending that, that most people uh, uh, remember. And uh, it was the greatest game I ever played in, I'll put it that way. The chance of seeing a fantastic finish increases dramatically in overtime. But no one could have been prepared for what they witnessed at Lambeau Field in Green Bay on the opening Sunday of the 1980 season. It was truly theater of the absurd. Hopeless, hopeless situation for the Philadelphia Eagles. They hadn't lost to the New York Giants in four years. They had been in playoff contention. Still would be. All they needed was a miracle. Under 30 seconds left of the game. From here on in, Pazarczyk can just fall on the football and there is nothing the Eagles can do. And Pazarczyk fumbles the football. It's picked up by Herman Edwards. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Winter in New England, not the vacation of choice for the Miami Dolphins, especially after they fell prey to a bizarre chain of events that left wounds that even time will not heal. It's the first time since I've been in professional football we've ever taken such serious exception to something which happened on the field. That kind of thing should not occur as a result of somebody putting a snowplow run by a convict with a day off from prison uh, out onto the field to give special advantage to the home team. I think it's the most unfair thing that I've ever been associated in in coaching. It's the most unsportsmanlike act that I've ever been around. The incident unfolded when Patriots head coach Ron Meyer called on an unexpected source to set the wheels in motion for victory. Snowplow driver Mark Henderson, a convicted burglar employed at the stadium on a weekend work furlough program, 
rode to the rescue and cleared a small area that enabled the Patriots to get a toehold for a field goal. But I was bewildered. I, I really was bewildered about what was happening out there on the field in front of my eyes. And uh, the magnitude of it never really set in until after he had lined up and kicked the field goal. Smith comes to the ball. There is the boot. It's flying down. I don't know whether to look on that as a good point in my life or a tremendously bad point. I'm sure if uh, you were the other coach on the other sideline, you would say it would be a black mark. But I know one thing. I can live with myself on it, and it wasn't an attempt to deceive or uh, it wasn't an attempt to cheat anybody. Then there are the games that suggest the gods must be crazy when results are determined not by strategy, but by what seems like divine intervention. Oakland trails 20 to 14. 10 seconds left. Stabler back. Here comes a rush. He sidesteps. Can he throw? He can't. The ball flipped forward as well. It's a wild scramble. Two seconds on the clock. Casper grabbing the ball. It is on the fumble. Casper has recovered in the end zone. The Oakland Raiders have scored on the most zany, unbelievable, absolutely impossible dream. Play. And I said, oh my God, here's a football. And uh, I tried to pick it up and run in, but, you know, the ball's bouncing around. So I just made this, you know, I tried to pick it up and it went kind of my hands and bounced off my knees. And, and if you look, it was just pure luck because when I fell down, the ball stayed underneath me. So when that play was over, you know, I was just there. It was the lucky person. I played 11 years and I had some success. And what do I remember before? Being a bumbling fool at the end of a holy roller. Madden is on the field. He wants to know if it's real. They said yes. Get your big butt out of here. He does. There's nothing real in the world anymore. The Raiders are on the football game. Nobody believes it. I don't know if the Raiders believe it. It's not real. A man would be a fool to ever try and write a drama and make you believe it. This one will be relived. were not so fortunate on one visit to Pittsburgh's Three Rivers Stadium. With a seemingly safe one-point lead, it appeared that the Raiders had stopped the Steelers. The Oakland Raiders have taken a 7-6 lead in a tough, tough football game. However, they were never prepared to stop the hand of fate. And this crowd is standing, 50,000 of them, seeing their team go behind by one point. It's down to one big play, fourth down and 10 yards to go. Terry Bradshaw to control. Running out of the pocket, looking for somebody to throw to. Fires it downfield. And there's a collision. And that's cut out of the air. The ball is pulled in by Franco Harris. Harris is going for a touchdown for Pittsburgh. Franco Harris pulled in the football. I don't even know where it came from. Well, the thing about, about that play that uh, uh, bothered me then, bothers me today, and will bother me until the day I die is that in the history of football, when a guy crosses a goal line, it's either a touchdown or it's not. They didn't call a touchdown. They didn't know if it was a touchdown. The referee leaves that huddle, which was in the end zone, and he goes over to the dugout on the Pittsburgh Steelers side, and he gets on the phone. And there's a lot of stories about who he called and what he called and what happened. But Mario Hubbard said that he overheard him, and what he actually did, he called the police. And he said, I'm the chief official in this ball game, and how many cops do you have to escort me off the field if I tell you what happened, which was that the ball hit Pittsburgh and there's no touchdown? The guy said, all I can give you is six police. He says, six? Is that all? He says, that's all you get. He says, in that case, six for Pittsburgh! From out of nowhere came Franco Harris, riding a white stallion down the field, heading up Franco's Italian army, charging under the football and galloping off into the sunset. The Raiders have played host to many fairy tale finishes, including the most famous game that never ended. Against Joe Namath's Jets, the lead changed hands six times before New York took a three point lead with precious little time remaining. In this nationally televised game, the Raiders began their final, if not futile, drive. 
Then precisely at 7 p.m. Eastern Stadium time, a network television decision was made to preempt the final minute of the game and return to regularly scheduled programming. That Sunday evening, it was the story of Heidi, the lovable little Swiss mountain girl. The sudden switch left millions of TV viewers unaware of what transpired in Oakland. Only those in the stadium and radio listeners would know. So Heidi's story began. As she was taken by her aunt to live with her grandfather in the mountains, no one at home saw the Raiders' Charlie Smith take a pass 45 yards for a score. As Smith ran through the Jets, Heidi was on her way down the mountain with her grandfather, headed for town. Back in Oakland, the Raiders headed for the end zone again for their second touchdown in eight seconds. So, while much of America followed Heidi's adventures with grandfather, Clara, Peter, and his herd of goats, they missed the conclusion of what will forever be known as the Heidi game, the most fantastic finish never seen. This man is twice as strong as this man, Tom Ziyech. The 49ers will start out this 1987 season with an 0-2 record. 26 to 20. The uh, Bengals lead here. They had just six seconds remaining. They have it fourth down at their own 30-yard line. And a give on to Brooks, and Brooks is tackled and stopped in the play. Will be ruled dead right there. So there's two seconds left, and Montana will get one throw. There's two seconds. Taylor and Clark. Wilson go to the far side, right to the near side. Don't be surprised that he forgets those three and goes to right. Here's Montana throwing for the end zone, right place. He's got it. Touchdown, 49ers. They win it. Right puts the ball for the touchdown. The 49ers have won it. That's an incredible ball game, my friend. When all appears lost, with no hope of victory, that's when the comeback takes on epic dimensions. Joe Montana and the 49ers have composed many magic moments. Montana back to throw. Big rush put on. He throws. He completes it underneath the Dwight Clark. He's the 40, the 45. He's the 50. He goes in the 40. It's a foot race. The 30. The 10. The 5. Touchdown, 49ers. That may be the one play that'll wake up the 49ers. Back to throw Montana. In the 1970s, Ken Stabler and the Renegade Raiders were aptly named. They were truly Raiders of Lost Causes. Few were as impressive as this matchup against the Super Bowl champion Steelers. Oakland trailed by two touchdowns with less than five minutes remaining but rallied to score 17 points to avenge two consecutive AFC Championship game defeats. The Saints were the victims of Stabler's greatest role as comeback kid. In a frantic fourth quarter viewed by millions on Monday night television, the Snake uncoiled three scoring passes in the final quarter to take the bite out of New Orleans. Stabler back under heavy rush, gets to Brass to the 42, gets away to the left, 30, to the 50, to the 40. To the 30, he's going to go all the way, the 20, the 10, the 5, touchdown, Raiders! And another dazzling, unbelievable play! Stabler back, he's going to pass, looking one way, comes back to the right, throws to Brass on the two, scrambles! Touchdown, Raiders! What an incredible story!
1979 was Stabler's final season in a Raiders uniform. It was also the last year in the NFL for America's resident captain of comeback, Dallas Cowboy quarterback Roger Staubach. I think the biggest thing about Roger was the fact that he never quit. It didn't matter how much the Cowboys were down. I remember in, in uh, San Francisco, they were ahead of us 14 or 15 points, and it was three minutes to go or something, and they were coming by our bench and hollering obscene things at us and talk, calling us losers. They laughed at us. They were making fun of us during the game because yeah, they were really enjoying having the upper hand on us. They didn't think there was any way because our offense was sputtering. We were doing absolutely nothing. And then Coach Lander decides to put Roger in, and I tell you, it was like a 180-degree turnaround in offense. It was the most unbelievable comeback because we were totally out of it. There wasn't even a pulse at one time during that game that we were going to win that game. And to turn it around, that's why you had such an emotional situation from our players because it really was a game that unless you were just the most unbelievable believer that you didn't think we were coming back. Cowboy veterans hadn't seen the likes of this before. And they watched in stunned amazement as Staubach performed his first miracle. It was bedlam on the sidelines, and it was just total ecstasy. It was a great time. We were rolling around and diving over each other like a bunch of children. One of the great, great, high, happy moments in sports. It was the beginning time for the great comebacks that Roger is so well known for throughout his career. When we won that game against San Francisco, from that moment on, we always believed that we could win the ball game. Staubach answered his final call to glory in his last regular season game. That was probably the best game that Roger ever played because the odds were so much against us, even more than it was back in the 49er game. He had to bring our club back against a very fine Redskin team that really had us on the ropes. And Riggins has a big hole first down, down the sideline, 40, 30, he's gone to the 20, the 10, he's still on his feet, touchdown, a 66-yard run by Riggins, and that may be more than the Cowboys can overcome. I was recording the game with Carol Day as a guest broadcaster that day, and in my heart, I believed that the Cowboys were going to win the game. And um, my announcer, the co-announcer with me, Brad Shem, kept saying, hey, Charlie, there's no way. The game's over. So, Brad, hey, you got to believe that this team can win. We always believed that if we could just get the ball back to Roger somehow. Clock is running, 2.38 left in the game. Can it happen again? Can they come back again? Shotgun formation, Staubach looking into the face of a four-man rush, throwing, caught. Gotta believe, Brad. A minute one left in the game. This is an all-timer. Cowboys at the Redskins 33. Second down 10. Trailing by six points. From the shotgun. Staubach has time. Throws. Caught. You gotta love them. I mean, you gotta love the Cowboys. They're the most exciting team in the NFL. They can pull it out. 42 seconds left in the game. Redskins lead by six. How do you how do you live like this? How can you live like this doing this every oh, week? This is what it's all about. This is a killer. Second down and eight from the eight-yard line. No shotgun this time. Staubach throwing in the end zone. Cody Hill. It was one of those routine Starbucks spectaculars. Simply the impossible made it come true. There was none better at that. 23 times in his remarkable career, Roger Starbuck had overcome defeat in the final minutes. When the tournament's over, there's one more fantastic... game there was more excitement in the stadium than I ever heard anywhere or felt anywhere. We were playing the Dolphins and it was going to be big. 
I'm excited, the team's excited, we're going to get them, and we kick off. You know, the opening kickoff crescendo, you know, like, ooh, 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 ooh. clap, we kick the ball. <laughs> they get the ball, and phew, all the way back. He runs, I think it was Nat Moore, ran it back 100 yards. <laughs> and now here we were, you know, Black Sunday, Raiders, Revenge, Dolphins, get them in Oakland, fans, crazy, team, crazy, good, going to do it. And the opening kickoff in our park, and they run it back all the way. The game would become a seesaw struggle that stretched and snapped the emotions of all who watched. Go ahead, air it out. Here's a deep one, the Brad, deep, deep. He's going! Raider fans were caught between delirium and doubt as the Dolphins surged ahead by five with two minutes remaining. This tense drama cried out for a crashing climax. When you get in a pressure situation like that, there's no one that you'd rather have involved in that play than Kenny Stabler. He has the uncanny knack of putting a ball uh, between people and between hands and, and just being able to slip things in there from all different angles, and that's exactly what he did. There he is, fading, looking, looking, looking. He's under the gun. He's caught, he throws. It Football evokes a range of passions that often leaves all involved mentally and physically drained. Such was the case in 1981, when the 49ers faced a moment of truth in the NFC Championship against Dallas. It was a moment that will live forever. So fasten your seatbelts now. We've got turbulence and plenty of it here at Candlestick Park now. Everything hangs in the balance now. The season, the outcome of a Super Bowl berth, hangs in the balance. Montana rolling out the right. Looking toward the end zone, throwing under pressure, throws his pass, caught by Clark, Clark got a touchdown, Clark, Clark has it, it's a touchdown for the 49ers! It became known quite simply as the catch, and it will always burn brightly in the corridors of our memory. Very often it's the magnitude of the game that brings out the best in its men. 1986's AFC Championship was such a contest. And the Broncos are 98 yards away from where they need to go. On this day, with the Super Bowl to prize, John Elway, whose extraordinary abilities had distinguished him early on as the quarterback for all ages, truly came of age. We walked in knowing that it was a do or die situation and that there was nothing else. It uh, either go to the Super Bowl or we're going home and we got a chance to do it on this drive and it was just a matter of getting out of the where we got some breathing room. Elway in the end zone and throwing it. It's complete winder dives out to the seven yard line. Elway's drop runs up in the pocket running left. John's across the 20 and out to the 26 yard line has the first down. Come on, guys. Broncos moved down the field as if decreed by some higher order. There was little sense of desperation as number seven calmly pointed the way to the end zone. Forty-two seconds to go. Broncos at the Cleveland five. Third down and a yard. The snap to Elway. The look, the throw, touchdown! Stunning.
crowning achievement was the impetus for the Broncos' 23-20 overtime victory. But what will always remain fixed in our minds is the drive. The operator said, very cheery. Good morning, Mr. Rensel. It's 8 a.m. It's 15 below zero. And there's a 20 mile an hour wind coming out of the Northwest. Have a pleasant day. On the coldest New Year's Eve in Green Bay history, they played the 1967 NFL Championship. I guess one of my most vivid memories of that game is of Bob Hayes the wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys, running his pass patterns with his hands in his pants. He put both hands down in the front of his pants, then he would run a pass pattern with his hands still in his pants. Hayes' world-class speed was not the only thing muffled by the brutal weather conditions. Meredith was sitting in the huddle, and he gets on one knee and he goes, red light, hang on, hmm. I said, uh, that's easy for you to say, Don, but wh what did you say? And what was happening was his cheeks were freezing, and he couldn't talk. And his, he was, his ability to formulate the words, words was leaving him. But eight seconds into the fourth quarter, the frozen lips of Don Meredith formed a bold yet risky call. A halfback option pass from Dan Reeves to Lance Rensel. The pass sliced through the high winds and frigid air to carve out a 17-14 cowboy lead. But this was tanker weather. Here, men first conquered the elements, then their opponents. In a survival test that called for guts and desire, Green Bay marched 68 yards to Doomsday's doorstep. It was a truly classic contest, resolved in the final seconds. Here are the Packers, third down, inches to go. The Bader. 17 to 14, Cowboys out in front. Packers trying for the go-ahead score. Starr begins the count. Takes the snap. He's got the quarterback. It was a finish as rare as a masterpiece painting when men sketch out images of victory. From miracle makers to raiders of lost causes to the ice bowl, these are fantastic finishes that will be forever frozen in time.